In 88 BC, as Sulla and his army were marching north through the rich volcanic farmlands of Campania, under arms to Rome, against Rome, and against the regime that was controlling it, it is said that despite the enthusiasm of his troops and the many justifications for his actions that he had just presented to them in their assembly, that he experienced a terrible anxiety, a wavering in his mind. He was, after all, preparing for what would surely soon be labeled an act of civil war against his own countrymen. But then, as he slept one night, while on the march, he had a dream. A goddess appeared to him, a strange goddess. When he looked her over, it became clear that this was not Aphrodite. Too bad. No, as he looked in her proud, cold eyes, he felt a chill. The moon shone behind her. And then, in an instant, he recognized her. It was a goddess he had seen on his tour of duty in Asia. The locals in Cappadocia called her Ma, goddess of the moon, goddess of war. What would the Romans call her? Minerva? Bellona? Whatever the case, she walked up to him and placed something in his hand. He looked down and he saw a crackling thunderbolt. And then she pointed off in the distance and Sulla saw all his enemies lined up, menacing. He knew what to do. And as she called each of them out by name, Marius, Sulpicius, Carbo, Cinna, Flaccus, and all the others, Sulla threw his thunderbolt at them and destroyed them one by one. Once they all lay dead on the ground, the goddess vanished. He woke up. So then, the goddess was promising him victory. And not just this... That was a patron goddess of one of the territories which had just been annexed by King Mithridates. This goddess, Ma, Bellona, however you want to call her, was she not beckoning to him to finish this task at hand and then to come liberate her in Asia to reclaim the dignity of the Romans in the East? He ordered his troops to pack up. It was time to move on Rome. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Cost of Glory, where it is our mission to retell the lives of the great Greek and Roman leaders to help you better face your present obstacles. We use Plutarch as our guide. This is part two of three of the life of Sulla. When we left Sulla at the end of the last episode, he was on his way to Rome after being deposed of his command by a plebiscite vote an egregious move orchestrated by Marius and Sulpicius. Well, he took Rome. He liberated it from its tyrants, as he called them. Yes, not everyone saw it that way. The townsfolk started throwing roof tiles down on his troops when they entered the city. But that all stopped once he ordered torches lit and threatened to burn down their rickety tenements if they wouldn't stop. Taking Rome took a bit of effort, a little struggle, None of the usual disorderly faction fighting, the mob violence. No, this time there were trumpets and battle lines. It was a proper military operation. And the truth is, Marius and Sulpicius put up a pitiful fight, scrambling to arm their shopkeepers and their freed slaves. In the end, they scattered without too much trouble. Once Sulla secured the center of the city, he invited the Senate to declare Marius and 11 of his closest associates public enemies, to be captured or killed on sight. With Sulla's troops standing outside the building, the Senate didn't seem like they were in a mood to make a fuss over whether this was proper precedent or not. And Sulpicius was quickly caught. He went into hiding at first, but one of his slaves ended up betraying him. And Sulla freed the slave as a reward. Then he had him executed, thrown off the Tarpeian rock for the heinous crime of betraying his master, Unfortunately, Gaius Marius escaped to Africa. When the dust settled, though, Sulla wanted people to see that he was no tyrant, but a liberator. He held elections for the following year, and he took special care to make sure that they were conducted fairly and without undue pressure. Some of his own preferred candidates for lower offices even lost. One of the consuls elected was a friend of his, but the other one was a man from the opposing political faction. His name was Cinna. 
After that, Sulla did take some legal action to set things right in Rome. As consul, he passed a law that no tribune of the plebs should be allowed to put any measure to vote without the Senate's approval. Wasn't it the demagogic, or you might even say tyrannical license that that office possessed that was the very thing that brought them into this mess in the first place? And he also formally annulled all the measures that Sulpicius passed while he was gone. But that was it. Surprisingly moderate, don't you think? Just to be sure, Sulla had the new opposition consul swear in public to uphold the laws and the arrangement that Sulla just established. And Cinna made a grand histrionic gesture. He picked up a stone and he said, May the gods cast me out of the city like this stone from my hand if I break my oath. And then he solemnly chucked it down in the view of many people. It was not all that convincing. But at that point, Sulla didn't really have any choice but to leave. A gruesome report was spreading through the city. In a single night, across the coastal cities of the province of Asia, King Mithridates orchestrated the murder of some 80,000 Italians and Romans living there. Business people, soldiers, administrators, survivors' reports were coming in, and they were telling of unimaginably horrific scenes. Whole families, men, women, and children, dragged from the altars where they fled for refuge and put to the sword, or simply slaughtered on the spot. In a way, though, you might say that the intensity of the local population's fury and resentment bore witness to how much money the Romans were extracting from the province up to that point. Asia, as we've said before, was the great Roman cash cow, and the sudden cease of income from taxes, loan payments, raw materials, and everything else caused a sudden financial crisis in Rome. There's no cash available. It was a dire emergency. In order to pay for his campaign, Sulla had to melt down the sacred temple gold set aside 600 years ago by the ancient king Numa Pompilius for emergency temple upkeep. And that still wasn't enough. Sulla had plenty of time to reflect on all this as he camped with his army a little bit outside of Athens. It was all across the sea now, seemed so distant as he sat here watching the Roman siege engines being constructed, the catapults and the rolling towers, and the pitch-soaked arrows being gathered. The city of Athens lies some three miles from the coast. It's in the middle of a wide valley, ringed on three sides by mountains. Its main port, called Piraeus, is a few miles downhill, and in those days it was a little city of its own. Piraeus even had its own walls, and it was against these walls first that all this war material would soon be hurled. Now that he was in Greece with a full grasp of the military and political situation, Sulla could see how much Marius had been underestimating Mithridates. As though Mithridates was some fat, exotic chicken ready for the plucking, who could easily be handled by a senile old man. As though he were not a strenuous mortal enemy who was more than capable of bringing Rome to its knees, willing and eager to exploit Rome's internal weaknesses, even to utterly destroy her if she kept bungling things and giving him opportunities. Mithridates now firmly controls practically all of Asia Minor and most of the Black Sea coast. He commands massive armies and huge fleets. And now he's making a strong play for Greece itself. His armies are in the north, in Thessaly, in Macedonia. The Achaeans and the Spartans in the south are allied with him. And now he has a formidable garrison in the Piraeus, Mithridates is wildly popular in Greece, too, and he's being celebrated as a liberator from the Roman oppressors. This brings us to Athens, where Sulla has recently arrived. Athens is currently controlled by a pro-Mithridates dictator named Aristion. Aristion is reputed to be a man of culture. In other words, someone easier to manipulate with words. This Aristion made friends with Mithridates, visited his court, Mithridates wowed him with promises of liberty for Athens from its subjugation to the Romans, reminding him of the greatness that once was, Athens the free, and so on. But in Sulla's perspective, Aristion is just Mithridates' puppet, just a delusional tyrant, preventing the rebellious Athenians from using good judgment about where their real interests actually lie. And if Mithridates were to beat the Romans, which he won't, 
Athens would soon find out how light the yoke of Rome really was in comparison to the alternatives. Athens is walled and well fortified, but Sulla can starve out Aristion and the Athenians with some patience. Inside the Piraeus, though, in the harbor town, is the more dangerous foe. It's a Greek from Cappadocia named Archelaus, Mithridates' top general. Now, it's already starting to get late in the summer, 87 BC, and time is not on Sulla's side. Given the financial crisis, there's not going to be much support coming from Rome anytime soon to help feed his 30,000 soldiers. And who knows how soon Mithridates' other two huge Pontian armies in Greece might move south to crush Sulla, relieve Archelaus, and permanently end Roman power in Greece. But the Piraeus is a difficult fortress to crack. Archelaus has strengthened the fortifications with massive bulwarks, and he can supply himself from the sea indefinitely. Oh, yeah, the Pontians currently control the seas, because Sulla can't afford any ships. So Sulla has to attack before the situation gets worse. So first, to prepare, he availed himself of all the available wood. He cut down all the beautiful, sacred old trees in Athens' prized suburban parks and the Academy and the Lyceum, which are outside the walls. And he requisitioned 10,000 mules to carry all the wood for his massive siege towers. So now, Sulla begins his heavy-duty siege of the Piraeus. It's slow going. The Romans build a massive siege mound, a ramp to try to get over the walls, but then the Pontians secretly dig a huge mine under the walls and then under the mound. Sulla rolls a heavy siege tower up onto the mound, but the mine caves in and the mound collapses. Weeks of work down the hole as the siege tower is destroyed. Archelaus builds his own siege towers inside the walls and he rolls them into position opposite Sulla's siege towers. And the two sides wage a vicious missile war with deadly machine-launched iron balls and flaming arrows. The Romans, meanwhile, have surrounded Athens with a smaller detachment, and they dug a trench around the city to prevent people from getting in or out, and to prevent food from getting in especially. Archelaus tries to sally out with a resupply party during the night to relieve the city, but the Romans are actually getting secret messages from inside the Piraeus, and they're ready, and they capture the food wagons. At one point, teams of Roman and Pontian sappers are digging opposite tunnels under the huge Piraeus fortifications, when suddenly the tunnels meet, and they fight a furious battle in the mixture of torch light and pitch darkness. At last, the Pontians retreat, and they deliberately collapse their own tunnel, and the stalemate continues. Through all this, Sulla is running out of money. So he turns to a few places where he knows that there's treasure to be had in abundance, for the right man. He sends demands for funds to the sacred temples of the god Asclepius at Epidaurus, to Zeus at Olympia, and the fattest purse of them all to Apollo at the sacred oracle of Delphi. These shrines are friendly enough to the Romans, but this kind of demand from a foreigner was egregious and very unwelcome. To Delphi, Sulla sends a Greek friend of his named Caphus, who lives near the oracle. And Caphus himself is horrified. He knows how sacrilegious it is to forcibly lay hands on temple treasures. And he addresses a meeting of the Grand Delphic Council with apologies and tears at what he's being forced to do by necessity. And a couple of the council members speak up. And they say that the night before, as they were walking by the temple, they heard emanating from within the sound of the god himself playing his holy harp. Does Sulla dare flout this clear sign from the divinity? And Caphus, hearing this message, he writes a letter to Sulla, explaining it all, hoping to gently steer Sulla away from the Delphic temple gold. But Sulla writes back and says, Cheer up, Caphus. I am amazed that the true import of this great sign from heaven has not occurred to you. Clearly, Apollo's singing was done in joy, not anger. Take boldly. Apollo is eager to help his servant. And so, Cephas did. After all, Sulla was only borrowing that money, right? Well, it is said that among the treasures of the temple, Cephas took a huge silver vase dedicated nearly 500 years earlier by the famous king Croesus, king of Lydia, 
The Delphians had to cut it into several pieces because it was just too big for any pack animal to carry. And that is how Sulla solved his money problems. The people up the hill in Athens, meanwhile, are getting hungry. They start to complain to the tyrant, demanding he surrender, come to terms with Sulla. At first, Aristion dismisses them with a scoff. And it is said that as the people began to starve, he kept up his feasting and his drinking parties during the daylight hours. And he could be seen dancing around in armor, making fun of the Romans. The people start to get madder, and they send the town council and the priests in a group to intercede with him. But Aristion orders his archers to scatter them with a volley of arrows. Eventually, though, in Plutarch's words, after a long time and with great reluctance, the tyrant sent out two or three of his fellow party-goers, as it were, to treat for peace. They made no offers, however, which had any hope of saving the city, but instead talked in lofty strains of Theseus and Eumolpus, that is, famous mythic founders of Athens, and of the glories of the Persian Wars. But Sulla interrupted them and said, My blessed friends, be gone, and take your speeches with you. The Roman people did not send me to Athens to learn its history, but to subdue its rebels. End quote. And so they returned empty-handed. But as the siege is wearing on through the winter months, Sulla gets a visit from the last person he expects to see out here in the field of war. It's his wife, and she's joined by a great throng of senators and dignitaries, friends of Sulla, They've brought shocking news with them from Rome. Cinna, the consul from the opposition party, was trying to push through some populist measures, but he got forced out of Rome in a riot. Then, though, instead of fading away in shame, he went around to the countryside, ginning up discontent among the Italians. And together with another disaffected junior officer named Sertorius, he managed to raise a proper army. And that's when things got really ugly. Because old Gaius Marius himself came out of exile at that point to join them. And he brought another army with him. Together, they cut off supplies to the city. They put her under siege and brought Rome herself to surrender. A feat that no enemy had managed for more than three centuries. Not the Etruscans, the Samnites, Pyrrhus, Hannibal, the Cimbri, the Teutones nor lately the Italian rebels, had now been perpetrated by Rome's own citizens, captured like she were some barbarian stronghold. And once they took control of the city, Marius and his supporters started rounding up their enemies, many of whom happened to be Sulla's best friends, and they executed them. The orator Marcus Antonius, members of the Caesar family, and Sulla's old commander from the Cimbrian Wars, Catullus, Noble Romans, patriots, all dead. In the looting and lawlessness that followed the capture, a mob surrounded Sulla's house, his house, and put it to the torch. His wife, Metella, snuck away with the children, and she barely escaped with her life. And here she was, standing in front of him in his camp in Attica, joined by some of the most prominent men from the Senate, now refugees, here were dealmakers, lawyers, heads of noble households, former leaders of Rome's citizen armies, confused, disheveled, and disgraced. Some reinforcements. And now Sulla was declared, by official vote of the Senate, an enemy of the state. So now, he can count not one, but two of the greatest military powers in the world as his mortal enemies. And think for a moment here, what must have been going through Sulla's head at this point? How likely was it that this man, with his six legions, no small army, but as we'll see, completely dwarfed by the resources Mithridates has at his disposal, and with Rome itself against him now too, how likely was it that he would hold out much longer? What odds would a betting man place on Sulla now? Ten to one against him? A hundred to one? More? Cinna and Marius must have been wagering that the game was all but over now. 
With the difficulty of the siege, his soldiers were already starting to get dispirited and mutinous. And they heard about what was happening at Rome now, too. They knew Sulla's situation was on a razor's edge. How lucky was Sulla feeling now? And that summer, there was a comet in the sky. The comet that we now know as Halley's Comet, making its 75-year circuit of the solar system. Mithridates' magi and his Chaldeans were surely telling the king that it was a sign that a new star was rising, that he was destined to conquer. Maybe Cinna was thinking the same thing. But first, some good news came from Rome. Marius had himself voted a seventh consulship, but then, within just a couple of weeks of taking it up, that January, he kicked the bucket. Finally. With Marius dead, maybe the gods haven't utterly abandoned the city. And Sulla was getting reports of the dire situation now in Athens. The price of a bushel of wheat inside those walls was soaring up to 1,000 drachmas, that is, 1,000 days' wages. People were scouring the Acropolis for chamomile flowers to eat. They were boiling down the leather from their shoes and oil flasks to make a grim stew. And then, one day, some of Sulla's troops overheard a few old men chatting from on the other side of the fortifications, complaining about how the tyrant was an incompetent idiot because he was failing to guard the weakest point of the walls, a place called the Heptacalcon, this news was immediately reported to Sulla. He went to inspect the spot for himself. Yes, it was time. In Plutarch's youth, the oldest citizens of Athens were just old enough to know people who were there when it happened. And the stories that were told of that infamous day agreed that this, the Heptachalcon, was the spot that Athens was taken. Sulla brings his troops up on an assault on this weak point with siege ladders and commandos, and after a struggle, they secure the wall and the area around it. And then, late in the evening, they bring up the equipment and demolish a large section and level it to the ground. And then Sulla personally led his army up over the rubble and into the city by the light of torches to the terrifying, thundering sound of trumpet blasts and war drums. Thinking upon Athens's rash obstinacy after so many years of benevolent Roman government, all the hardships and the taunting and the Roman lives lost through the siege, and thinking of his troops' mad despair recently, Sulla decided to give only one instruction. Spare the buildings. And then he let his soldiers loose. Sulla knew that in recognition of Athens' great efforts to save the Greeks and the Persian Wars, of its unparalleled cultural gifts to mankind, the city had been treated gently by many conquering forces. By the Spartans under Lysander, by the Macedonians under Alexander and after, and by the Romans of the past, too. Everyone would expect him to do the same. For these reasons, it would make an excellent example to set for any other cities who had thrown their lot in with Mithridates. The city of Athens would become a byword. Don't be like Athens. And in Plutarch's day, an oral tradition preserved horrific memories of a river of blood flowing from the Keramicus neighborhood out through the Dipolon Gate. As dawn broke, however, two prominent Athenian exiles who were helping Sulla's war effort threw themselves at his feet and begged him to forgive Athens, to stop the pillaging and the murder, spare their city any further bloodshed. The Roman senators in his camp joined them in begging the same. And so, at last relenting, Sulla spoke a few words in praise of the ancient Athenians, and he said that he forgave the living in honor of those long dead. Then he ordered the sack to stop. By the light of day, the Roman soldiers behold with their own eyes how bad things had gotten in the city. It was not a sight for the squeamish. 
Human flesh was found in a number of houses, being prepared for meals. Aristion the tyrant fled to the Acropolis and barred himself in there with some holdouts. He was eventually starved out, surrendered, and executed. With this boost of morale behind him, Sulla rallies his troops and storms the harbor fort at Piraeus and finally takes it. Archelaus retreats to the sea with his Pontian forces. Athens's civic monuments he spared, but Piraeus held less symbolic significance and was a more dangerous base for the enemy. So Sulla burned it mercilessly, including many of its famous buildings like the naval arsenal of Philo, a beautiful architectural wonder dating from the era of Demosthenes and Alexander. A wonder, that is, that could be used to house and repair hundreds of enemy ships. In case fortune never turned her face in the other direction, Sulla made sure that Archelaus could never recover Piraeus because there was hardly anything left to recover. But he has no time to enjoy his victory. One of Mithridates' other generals in Greece is at last bearing down through Thessaly, through north-central Greece, with a staggeringly large force. The reports are that this commander is bringing 100,000 foot soldiers, 10,000 cavalry, and 90 scythe-bearing chariots. It's an army more than three times the size of the Romans. A scythed chariot is what it sounds like, a famously gruesome machine of Persian origin, a large chariot pulled by several horses with meter-long, razor-sharp, curved blades protruding from the axle, spinning along with the wheel. These chariots, along with the famous Pontian cavalry, which was drawn from the grassy steppe lands of Armenia and Cappadocia, excellent horses and excellent horsemen, they would all have difficulty maneuvering in the rugged hills and dales of Attica, the region where Athens lay. But Sulla was forced by necessity to leave the favorable territory of Attica since its land-based supply chains were now exhausted of food and supplies and the enemy controls the sea. He'll have to fight the barbarian in Boeotia, an area in central Greece with wide, flat valleys where the Asian horses will be the most dangerous and where the Roman infantry will be outnumbered three to one. This is going to take some generalship. The armies square off against each other at the northwest foothills of Mount Parnassus. Parnassus is the mythic home of the Muses, as well as the Oracle of Delphi. And these foothills also happen to host the native home of Plutarch himself, the town of Chironea, from where this battle that was coming was eventually going to take its name. And old Archelaus, after escaping the Piraeus, he now meets up with the Pontian army, and assumes control of the combined forces of Mithridates. The king himself is still campaigning in Asia. Sulla first camps in the next valley over to the west from Chironea. It's a wider valley, the valley of Elatea, if you know your Greek geography. He occupies a strong hill and he digs in earthworks, but he carefully keeps his troops out of the clutches of the massive enemy army. And it comes to be that in this engagement, in fact, the very size of the united Pontian army with its troops gathered from diverse regions and ethnicities of Asia and the Balkans, Thracians, Scythians, Bithynians, Cappadocians, Macedonians, Greeks, the size itself becomes a stumbling block for Archelaus. The Pontian army, they start to scoff at the puny Roman forces, and the subordinate commanders slacken in their discipline, and they let their soldiers go around and sack and plunder nearby villages. They're off task. And Sulla has dug in so effectively that Archelaus decides to move to the next valley over, to the east, where Chironea is located. His plan is to cut off the Roman supply and communication lines stretching to Athens, he wants to starve Sulla out and force him into an engagement. But here, Sulla showed some of his brilliance as a commander and his startling quickness. As Sulla knows, Chironea is in a narrower valley. And as soon as he sees Archelaus slowly wheeling his huge army into a different position, he sends a crack force in to rush past and assert control of the strong positions in the valley of Chironea, and one of the strong positions that he grabs is the town of Chironea itself, which 
happens to still be allied to Sulla. And at this point, Archelaus makes a fatal error. He commits all his forces to the valley of Chironea anyway, carrying on with the original communication choke-off plan. But in the valley of Chironea, he's going to be severely handicapped. Not only is it narrower than the valley they were just in, and it's cut through by a sizable river, the Cephasus, this is all going to majorly hinder his cavalry and his chariots, But on top of that, Sul has just prevented him from taking any of the secure infantry positions in the valley with his preemptive strike. But Archelaus was assuming that Sulla would not dare to attack the huge Pontian army. And in this, he was mistaken. While Archelaus is still moving into position in the valley, starting to set up camp, Sulla speeds in with the rest of his forces and engages Archelaus' forces suddenly, boldly, Archelaus very quickly goes from trying to force Sulla into an unfavorable engagement a few days earlier to now suddenly being forced himself into an unfavorable engagement. And they fight a furious battle. He has no choice. The chief commanders on either side are both riding back and forth madly from one end of the field to the other to shore up the wings in their battle lines. But the Pontians aren't able to take advantage of their huge numbers in this confined space. And some of their units aren't even present for the fight. They're off sacking little villages. And very importantly, the scythed chariots have no room to build up the speed and momentum that could make them so deadly. After a bitter struggle, the Romans turn the Pontians, first on the right wing, then on the left, and then finally in the center. A rout ensues. And as Sulla also foresaw, the Pontians have no favorable route for retreat, The Romans pin them into their half-built camp on the side of a mountain, and in the chaos, they slaughter thousands. By the end of the engagement of the massive 110,000-strong Pontian army, only 10,000 escape with Archelaus to their base on the coast. The Pontian army is virtually annihilated. Sulla has just scored one of the greatest military upsets of the era— And after the battle, when his camp aides are tallying up the death toll on their side, Sulla approaches them. Have you determined yet the number of total casualties? Still working on it, sir. And Sulla was pleased to present the results of his own independent research into the matter. The total number of casualties from the Romans and allies, he informs them, was 15. 15, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. And so that was what they wrote down. Happily, later on, two soldiers, formerly thought dead, wandered into camp wounded. So they amended the number to 13. And that was what was announced to the troops and the allied cities. And that was what went down in the history books. Sulla understood that in sensitive matters of morale and public perception, it was important to make sure you got the facts straight. And then Sulla erects a victory monument on site at Chironea. He singles out two brave fighters from among Plutarch's own countrymen, his forebears. In the lead-up to the battle, these two volunteered to run a death-defying assault on a fortified enemy position on a hill overlooking the town. And it proved to be a crucial stage in the victory. Their names were Homoloicus and Anaxidemus. And in the 1990s of our era, lo and behold, a certain carved stone was unearthed at Chironea. And as the archaeologists dug the dirt and sediment out of its grooves, they made out, written on it, two names, Homoloicus and Anaxidemus. Sulla retires to nearby Thebes, the leading city in this region of Boeotia. And he stages a great victory celebration there at a location right next to a famous shrine known as the Fountain of Oedipus. That's supposed to be where the mythic king of Thebes, Oedipus Rex, washed his hands after he unwittingly murdered his father on the road from Corinth on his way to meet the Sphinx. And the Roman victors stage a drama contest. Thebes, you know, is the setting of a number of famous works of classical Athenian tragedy, Sophocles' Oedipus, chief among them, also Euripides' Bacchant Women, which is the story of the god Dionysus' notorious visit to Thebes. And for a lover of the theater like Sulla, this is a rare treat. 
But since the Thebans themselves disappointed him in this war by betraying Rome early on, he used them to solve his temple debt problem. Tax revenues incoming to the Theban treasury were going to be redirected to the Temple of Delphi until the funds he requisitioned were paid off in full, which was going to take many, many years. But Sulla's barely caught his breath when he's given a reminder of the doom hanging over his head from Rome. Cinna has dispatched to the east another full army headed by the other consul, who was, of course, now a man of Cinna's own party. Valerius Flaccus was his name. He was the replacement for the late Gaius Marius. And this guy Flaccus's mission was to take up the war effort against Mithridates on behalf of the allegedly legitimate Roman government, Cinna's government. Doing this, of course, would imply relieving Sulla of his command, peacefully or otherwise. Sulla opted for otherwise. And so he sets out with his army to meet Flaccus in Thessaly, to the north of Boeotia. But maybe the goddess was smiling on him once again because she didn't want him to have to fight his own countrymen here, at least, on this foreign soil. Because as soon as he reaches southern Thessaly, Sulla receives a report that another general of Mithridates has shipped in another huge army to Boeotia. This one is not much smaller than the first. It's 90,000 soldiers. They're camped near Orchomenus, a little east of Chironea. Sulla wheels around and speeds back to Boeotia. Once again here, he's cut off from his supply lines in Athens, and he's outnumbered. But he's optimistic because he just got a message from the oracle of Trophonius at nearby Levadia. And to consult the oracle of the dead hero Trophonius, you have to go and travel up to a certain wooded glen nestled in the foothills of Parnassus. And after observing a strict ritual diet and bathing in cold water only and purifying your mind and your body, you ascend to a stone cave hollowed out in the side of the mountain. And in this cave is a dark pit some 20 feet deep where you're let down by a ladder. And then you're instructed to approach the wall and sit down and insert your feet into a certain hole in the side of this pit at the bottom and carefully place ritual honey cakes around your body and lie down. From there, according to the ancient traveler Pausanias, the demigod Trophonius would suck you under the earth like you were in a fast-flowing river, and your body would travel who knows how deep, how fast, to what God's domains. And in this section of the journey, some people would hear messages, some would see visions or dream dreams, or however the divinity chose to reveal his wisdom. And then, when you emerge from this experience, the priests are waiting and available to help you make sense of it all. Sulla had a friend consult the oracle for him, and the news was good. Trophonius prophesied yet another grand victory for Sulla to take place somewhere nearby. The armies square off near Orchomenus, which is again in Boeotia, on a wide plain that, in those days, ran alongside a dense marshland and a shallow inland lake called Lake Copaeus. And Sulla once again has to address the challenge of the Pontian cavalry in this flatland. So to do this, he begins by using a classic strategy of Roman warfare, one in which his troops are quite experienced by now, and Sulla in particular was a true master, namely the earthwork. He digs two great trenches in such a way as to force the Pontians to go around and advance through the marshes to trip up their cavalry. But whether or not he meant this to happen, the digging has the effect of once again provoking the Pontians into an engagement that they're not totally ready for, but they see what's happening and they can't just let Sulla get away with it. Archelaus sends his cavalry charging up to the fortifications, still under construction, and Sulla brings his soldiers up to defend. And they trade shovels for swords, and a fight ensues. But the Pontians are overwhelming in their numbers, and the Roman lines start to buckle, and a rout begins. At this point, Sulla sees a disaster about to happen, and so he snatches up one of the Roman flags and hops on his horse, and he charges forward against the stream of fleeing soldiers, like Washington at Monmouth, and he calls out to them, For me, Romans, an honorable death here. But when they ask you where it was that you betrayed your commander, 
remember to tell them it was at our commonus. And this personal charge by the general himself turns the tide, and the Romans end up pushing the Pontians back. The men take a rest and regroup, and then they start to advance further and start digging trenches even closer to Archelaus' camp. Saul is trying to channel them further into narrow corridors to neutralize their superior numbers again. But then they come out, and another fierce fight ensues. And in this fighting, Archelaus's son-in-law himself falls, fighting gallantly. The Roman infantry hems in the Pontine archers, and in this melee in close quarters, the enemy ends up grabbing arrows by the handfuls and trying to stab the Romans with them. But in the end, Sulla ends up driving the enemy back into their fort. The next day, Sulla approaches their fort itself, and he starts trenching it off early in the morning. He's tightening the net, and Archelaus has no good answer. They simply can't match the Romans' engineering power. He charges Sulla's earthworks, but on this occasion, when they get driven back for the third time, something snaps in the Pontian soldiers' morale, and a panic sweeps across the army. They flee into their camp and then away from it, and they offer pitiful resistance. The Romans overwhelm their base, and they chase them into the bogs. By the end of the day, Lake Copaeus is filled with bodies. And Plutarch says that even up to his day, 200 years later, locals were still fishing out helmets and bows and fragments of breastplates from the lake. It was such a huge calamity for Mithridates' forces. And so for a third time, Sulla defeated Archelaus at the Battle of Orchomenus. Through a combination of superior troops, superior generalship, and yes, divine good fortune. Mithridates at this point is in a bad place. The other Roman general, Flaccus, the one who was sent from Rome as Sulla's replacement, he decided to bypass Greece entirely and go right for Mithridates in Asia. And Flaccus himself actually shortly after that gets murdered by another commander who was with him in the camp and more popular with the troops, a guy named Fimbria. And Fimbria now, after taking charge, he's ravaging through Mithridates' underfortified positions in the east. And so, desperate to staunch the bleeding, Mithridates allows Archelaus to open up peace talks with Sulla. The two men meet on the coast of Greece, on the border of Boeotia and Attica, at a place called Delium, where there was a great temple of Apollo. Archelaus opens the negotiation. He's well aware of how precarious Sulla's position is. Sulla has no ships. His purse is nearly empty. His enemies control Rome. And now there's a large, hostile Roman army just a day or two sail away across the Aegean in Asia. Archelaus makes his offer. If Sulla will abandon Asia and Pontus to Mithridates, Mithridates will peacefully cede Greece to Sulla, and additionally supply him with many ships, much gold, and as many soldiers as he needs to return to power in Rome. And this might sound like a fair deal to some, especially given Sulla's difficult situation. Mithridates and Archelaus, after all, have correctly identified Sulla's most urgent needs and intentions. But Sulla uses the classic negotiation technique of reframing. With apparent earnesty, he replies, Archelaus. Why don't you abandon Mithridates, take the crown for yourself, and become an ally of the Romans? And to this, Archelaus, a little shocked, he responds, Well, that's abhorrent, that's treason, I'm no betrayer. And Sulla replies, So then you, Archelaus, a Cappadocian and a slave of a barbarian king, or, if you like, his friend, you would not consent to a disgraceful act for great rewards, but you have the gall to propose treachery to me, Sulla, who am a Roman commander. In other words, Sulla was saying, how dare you suggest that I must march against my own countrymen, with your help or without it? How much more unthinkable would such an act be if the cost of getting help was to betray Rome's honor and abandon Rome's province of Asia? And then he goes on to remind Archelaus which party it was who just won three major battles and which party lost. 
Archelaus falls silent for a while, and then he changes his tone. He gives up his bluff, and he humbly asks what Sulla wants in exchange for peace. And this is tricky because Sulla has to think not just about ending the war, but about how whatever treaty he ratifies is going to be viewed when news gets back to Rome. He can't really afford to make any concessions at all, or his enemies at home are going to use that to discredit him as a betrayer of Roman interests for the sake of personal gain. On top of that, going gentle would project weakness and insecurity to his troops, as though he hadn't just won those battles, as though Sulla weren't confident of his legitimacy. Obviously, he can't afford that either. And so, Sulla ends up making an incredibly uncompromising set of demands. Mithridates not only has to cede control of every single territory he has claimed since his rise to power, including the territories of tenuously Roman-allied client kings like Ario Barzanes, but he must also supply Sulla with 70 bronze-plated ships and 2,000 talents of silver, a huge amount of money. If he will do that, Sulla will be happy to call Mithridates a friend of the Romans. Archelaus, incredibly, concedes to all these. And so he travels back to get the treaty ratified by the king himself. But then message comes back that Mithridates is balking about this and that clause, and there's some stern words back and forth, and at last Archelaus comes back with an offer from the king himself to meet in person. And so Sulla crosses a small force over the Dardanelles Straits, about 2,000 men and 200 horse, and he meets Mithridates near the legendary ruins of ancient Troy at Dardanus. Mithridates brings 20,000 heavy infantry, 6,000 horse, and a squad of scythed chariots. He has 200 ships patrolling the straits nearby. Maybe he thinks he'll wow this Roman with an awesome display of force. And the armies camp across from each other at opposite sides of a valley, And the men watch as the two leaders go out with their small escorts and meet in the middle. Mithridates, in the images that we have of him that survive from antiquity, he's often portrayed with the lion's head helmet in the fashion of Hercules. He claimed to be descended from both Cyrus the Great and Darius the Great, kings of Persia, and also from three of the greatest Macedonian generals of Alexander, who later became kings, Antipater, Antigonus, and Seleucus. Mithridates must have been quite a sight for Sulla's bodyguards to look on, with his kingly regalia and his huge stature. He was a tall and powerfully built man, around 50, about Sulla's age. They probably conducted their negotiations in Greek. Mithridates begins by stretching out his hand in a gesture of friendship. Sulla remains still and asks him if he plans to put a stop to the war on the terms the Romans agreed to with Archelaus. Mithridates lowers his hand and says nothing. And Sulla says, Surely it is the part of the victors to be satisfied being silent, while suppliants are the ones to speak first. Once again, Sulla, a first-rate negotiator, resisted Mithridates' attempt to benchmark their negotiations with friendship. Starting with a handshake would have had implications. It would symbolically concede the very thing Mithridates was there to negotiate for. But Sulla sent a clear message. The parties are not reconciled yet. Both men also recognizing here the power of silence in negotiations. So Mithridates surrenders this first move, and he begins to speak next of how he had long been friendly with the Romans, and only with great reluctance had he been forced to war on them through the insults they made on his kingdom by picking off his allies, depriving him of territory, consistently showing disrespect, and always indulging their greed for gain. Sulla interrupts him. I have long heard, Mithridates, that you are an exceedingly talented orator, and now I can see it for myself, considering the great cleverness of the justifications you make for complete and wicked lawlessness. But let us set aside these words. You know the magnitude of what you've done. 
But Sulla proceeded to remind him anyway of the tens of thousands of innocents slaughtered without cause, the war of aggression, and many other breaches of faith. I ask you again, will you abide by the agreements the Romans have made with Archelaus? And onlookers here could be forgiven for being a little shocked at the boldness of Sulla here, outnumbered by a factor of ten in the immediate vicinity. But Sulla knows that behind this imposing image set before them, Mithridates is experiencing a personal and political crisis. He's just written off the huge cost of two massive armies. And with the rogue Roman general Fimbria rampaging through Asia, he's spread extremely thin. Sulla also knows Mithridates is now starting to face defections from his allies. The king has just brutally murdered a number of Galatian chieftains who he suspected of plotting against him and he forcibly exiled all the leading citizens from the powerful island of Chios, who gave him cause to doubt their loyalty. And you know, Sulla judged right. Mithridates swallows his pride, and to Sulla's question, he replies, yes, he would abide by the original agreement. Sulla smiles and walks up to him and embraces him with a kiss. And with that, Mithridates handed over the promised ships to Sulla and sailed back home to Pontus, now officially a Roman ally. Was this the moment when Mithridates decided to dedicate the rest of his life to destroying Rome's power in the east, to bleed it dry or die trying? At any rate, that was, in fact, how he ended up spending the next 22 years. But that's a story for the lives of Lucullus and Pompey, coming soon. And even though Mithridates ended up hurting badly from that agreement, Sulla still had to defend himself vigorously against the protests of his army, who thought Mithridates got off way too easy for his crimes. But there were more pressing challenges to face. Sulla now brings the rest of his men over to Asia and turns his attention to the problem of the other Roman army in the region, the hostile one under Fimbria, the charismatic sociopath who murdered his friend, the consul Flaccus. Sulla approaches and camps within a quarter mile of Fimbria's fort. He sends an embassy demanding Fimbria to yield his illegal command to the new lawful governor of Asia. Fimbria replies with a message, Why, you're no more lawful a commander than I am. And so Sulla dispenses with a formal reply and immediately starts digging one of his signature trenches all the way around Fimbria's camp. Now there's no doubt about what's coming next. Fimbria's troops start to sneak away and desert to Sulla. Those who do remain demand he lay down arms and join Sulla. Fimbria fumes. He threatens them with capital punishment. But it's no use. They don't want to fight Sulla. Sulla sends in a legate who happens to be the exiled Rutilius Rufus, and he very kindly suggests that Fimbria discreetly excuse himself and leave Asia by boat. To this, Fimbria replies, I know a better route. And so, he retires to a nearby temple of the god Asclepius and falls on his sword, as they say. Sulla sends a report back to Cinna and Carbo and friends in Rome, He thought they'd like to know the good news. Asia is now, once again, safely in Roman hands. The client kings and friends of the Romans, King Nicomedes and Ario Barzanes, they've been happily restored to their kingdoms of Bithynia and Cappadocia. Mithridates has been neutralized. The criminal Fimbria is dead. And the 10,000 soldiers Rome sent under Flaccus are now safely in the custody and happily under the command of the new lawful governor of Asia and Greece, Lucius Cornelius Sulla. He's looking forward to returning home for his triumph. But before Sulla returned to Italy to settle so much unfinished business, he wanted to give his men and himself a little bit of time to enjoy their victory and the famous sights of Greece. He goes back to Athens, where he gets initiated into the famous 
Eleusinian Mysteries, that secret revelatory cult celebration of the goddesses Demeter and Persephone, which promised to its followers enlightenment and salvation in the afterlife. And Sulla, of course, always was a lover of the fine literary arts and books, and while he's at Athens, he makes a splendid discovery. The late tyrant, Aristion, had an associate, the man who was his chief of coin-minting operations, another man of culture, the now also late Apelicon of Teos, and this man was a noted book collector. This Apelicon hunted down rare manuscripts with the same vigor and ruthlessness that Sulla intended to hunt down his enemies, and Apelicon managed to acquire a full library of the works of the great Athenian philosopher Aristotle. These books of Aristotle had somehow fallen into the hands of irresponsible private collectors, shortly after Aristotle's death, and they lay in obscurity for centuries, getting gnawed on by worms. But Sulla took them in, into his benevolent custody, and he eventually brought them back home to Rome. And there was a teacher working there at Rome, a man who was a member of the peripatetic school of philosophy, the one that Aristotle himself once founded. And this teacher's name was Andronicus of Rhodes, if you're interested. And this Andronicus compiled these works of Aristotle into an organized corpus and edited and published them. And in fact, this is the discovery from which more or less all of our manuscripts today of Aristotle's works ultimately descend. And there's another story worth telling about Sulla's doings at this time. Well, after the Battle of Orchomenus, when Sulla was pursuing the remnants of Mithridates' army, he ended up totally destroying three small cities on the coast of Boeotia, that were harboring fugitives. And now, though, after retiring his army to Athens, Sulla started experiencing a painful gout in his feet, and he decided to retire to a famous hot springs on the island of Euboea. The place is called Edipsos. It's still in operation to this day. It faces the shore of Boeotia. It's right across from the shore of Boeotia. And Sulla is there at the baths, enjoying himself. And of course, he invited along some local actors to party with him while he was convalescing, taking the waters there. And it's said that one day, as he was walking along the beach, he met some fishermen. And these men decided to bring him a gift of some exquisite fish and cook it for him. And tasting the fish, he marveled. And they get talking, and he, he hears that these men are from Halai, one of the Boeotian cities that he destroyed for harboring fugitives. Then he starts up and he says, What? Is any man from Halai still alive? And the men, recognizing now who he is, they're struck pale with terror. But Sulla chuckles and says, Ah, be of good cheer, my fellows. And then he indicates the fish. You have brought with you a most worthy and esteemed party of intercessors. And then he bid the men go in peace. Now, you can't deny that Sulla dealt harshly with Greece. Athens sacked Thebes and many other cities under massive indemnity. Halai and others savagely depopulated. The old Macedonian overlords of Greece never would have reacted so viciously. But Sulla could point out that this was the long-standing Roman way of dealing with traitors reward friends lavishly, but those who don't keep faith in their commitments punish them with cold savagery. For a long time, the Roman presence in Greece had been quite benevolent. For too long, perhaps. These Greeks, what was it that made them so foolishly think that Rome, the city of power, would cede these territories complacently to some minor eastern dynast, that they would not put their full muscle behind their claims. What was it that made the Greeks expect lenient treatment if their risky betrayal fell through? The ambassadors from Athens, giving him a history lesson when their city was surrounded in mortal danger. It was arrogance. And not just Athens. At how many places had he seen it now? The great pride with which men celebrated their national festivals, their old poets, their old military exploits, and the grand sense of dignity it gave them, as if they were the equals of their forefathers, as if they deserved special treatment. It was the hubris of the pedigreed lapdog barking at the caged lion. 
But every now and then, you must unlock that cage of politeness and convention and remind people of the facts. Silly people. And was it so different at Rome? Strip most senators today of their entourages of slaves, their suburban villas, their exotic fish ponds. Melt down the wax masks of the ancestors who built their sacred family hearths. Strip them of their names and titles, the symbols of authority, and put them in front of hardened fighting men. See how well they lead then. See who rises to the top. Where will their arrogance go? Rome had forgotten her old ways. These Greeks had forgotten her old ways. Sulla reminded them. Greece and Asia would not be rebelling any time soon. And Sulla had been magnanimous to most of Marius' supporters, to the populares. He allowed Cinna to be elected consul on his own watch before he left. And what happened? The flame of populares' resentment had been blown out, but the embers grew hotter under the ash and then burst forth with even more fury. They killed many of his friends, burned his house, nearly killed his wife and children, sent an army to destroy him. Was that what was best for the Republic? And so, when another letter arrived on Sulla's desk in Greece from distinguished members of the Senate pleading for Sulla to exercise clemency when he returned to sort out his grievances with his adversaries at Rome peacefully, a letter which arrived at the same time that reports were coming in that Cinna and his new colleague in the consulship, a political protege of his, Papirius Carbo, they were rushing around Italy now, furiously trying to stir up support against Sulla, recruiting troops for an army to oppose him. Well, Sulla decided to send a letter back, expressing, as he saw them, the facts. Cinna and his associates, the party of the late Gaius Marius, had treacherously made war on Rome itself, seized her by force through a siege, and then captured and murdered, whether through show trials or through naked violence, its most prominent citizens, his own friends. Sulla was returning to avenge the injustices of the past few years. Innocent citizens, including the innocent among the new Italians added to the fold, should therefore take heart and not fear for he did not blame them for anything. And it is said that when this letter arrived and was read in the Senate, the room fell silent, stricken with terror. And then the old men demanded that Senna and Carbo cease raising this army until another embassy could be sent and another plea presented for an agreement with Sulla. When the consuls heard this request, nodded, left, and then proceeded to completely ignore it, and hasten to finish their war preparations. And it was around this time that Sulla received another message from the divine realm, that is, from one of the local oracles, this time from the goddess Aphrodite, whom the Romans called Venus. Venus, according to the myth, was the mother of Aeneas, the Trojan, the demigod hero and ancestor of the Roman people. And the story is that after the Greeks sacked Troy, Aeneas escaped Troy and made his way over land and sea to Italy with Venus's help. And he founded the line from which Romulus and Remus descended, the legendary founders of the city of Rome. In the oracle that was delivered to Sulla at this time, Venus, or Aphrodite, proclaimed to him, "'Obey me, Roman!' In her care for you, Aphrodite has given great power to the race of Aeneas. And she promised him wide power if he would dedicate a golden axe to one of her temples. And later on, he did send that golden axe in thanksgiving. Because as he lay one night in the midst of his great tribulations that followed, he had a dream. It was a vision of a huge battle in which he was fighting his enemies, and he saw Venus there, goddess of love and charm, goddess of the Roman race, fighting alongside him, wielding that very golden battle axe she requested. Difficult challenges lay ahead, but as usual, Sulla was optimistic. Maybe, with Venus's help, 
they would go on to do a deed worthy of the divine lineage of Aeneas, who founded the Roman people out of the ashes of Troy. Was it now their duty to purge away the pollution and found the city anew? Didn't the Romans have a long history of building greatness out of disaster? Were they not also descendants of the same Romulus who, as the walls of the newly founded city were going up, quarreled with his brother Remus and murdered him? If you took a long perspective and considered all the precedents, well, surely you could come around to the position that, either way, Rome's future looked bright. Spring had now come, and it was time to assemble the fleet. They were going home to test fortune once again. Now, before moving on to the events of part three, let's consider a few lessons which we can take away from Sulla and his campaigns in the East. In this episode, we've seen Sulla's humor shine through, as well as his complete immunity to the dignified poses people often take when attempting to impose their will. Consider his contempt for the Athenian ambassadors, his bluntness with Archelaus, and his unflinching mastery of King Mithridates, probably the most formidable foe Rome had faced in generations. Maybe you'd say that this derived from Sulla's keen sense of justice. But his was not a justice in the civilized and benevolent manner of an Aristides or a Cato, but more that of a Thrasymachus, justice defined as the rule of the strong and their right to impose their will over those who cross them. Sulla imposed this justice on Greece. He was harsh. And you might say that it was necessary to make an example of Athens, Piraeus, Thebes, Halai, to preserve the peace. But Sulla was as warm and flattering to his friends as he was cold and merciless to his enemies. Plutarch tells how Sulla lavished gifts on his soldiers in these times, spoiling them after plundering the temples. And if you call that justice, to help your friends and hurt your enemies— well, just remember, it's not a justice that ages well, and even not a justice that resets the scales at a stable balance. Plutarch condemns Sulla's rapacity in Greece. He compares him to other Roman commanders in Greece who preceded him, like Titus Flamininus and Aemilius Paulus, whose lives we'll tell sometime. These men kept their hands off the temples and increased the honor and dignity of those establishments. They probably spoiled their soldiers a little too, and yet they won admirers among posterity because of their restraint. But did Sulla win admirers among posterity? Sulla was remembered most of all as a precedent for the increasingly demagogic and unilateral way that the Roman generals behaved in the generations after him, men like Pompey, Caesar, and Antony, men who did their fair share to destroy the Republic. But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves there. Remember, harsh justice will exponentially increase the scrutiny with which people view your other deeds. On the other hand, take a practical lesson you can use from Sulla's generalship. Sulla was a master of earthworks. When will I dig a trench in front of an enemy camp, you ask? Well, to use earthworks is to question the assumptions of the coming battle you face. Most people see the land as a given, as the setting, immutable as fate. Sulla saw it as another set of game pieces that could be manipulated. If you want to win a battle or win over a prospect, whether it's a tense negotiation or a pitch for funding, a difficult conversation, even a job interview, what assumed circumstances can you in fact alter to make sure you're fighting on advantageous ground? Can you change or manipulate the setting? Should you go to them or should they come to you? Pick a loud place or a quiet place? The successful general is a master of the setting and the timing of the engagement. And think carefully about these for the next confrontation you plan. If you got something out of this, tell a friend, leave a review, sign up for our email list at ancientlifecoach.com. Stay strong, stay ancient. This is Alex Petkus. Till next time. <laughs>